In today's video, I'd like to take a look at the Cambridge Annotated Study Bible. This is an older, newer Revised Standard Version Study Bible. I believe it was published in about 1993. It includes only the 66-book Protestant canon. For size comparison purposes, I have it here with the HarperCollins Study Bible and the New Oxford Annotated Bible. Both are New Revised Standard Version editions. And as you can tell, this Bible for today, the Cambridge Annotated Study Bible, is somewhat wider and thinner than the other two. In terms of dimensions, it's nine and a half inches tall, seven and one sixteenth inches wide, and it is one and three quarters inch thick. The uh, text is formatted in two columns in a par paragraph format. Each column is 49.3 millimeters wide. I count about 47 characters per line on a closely spaced page, and there are as many as 57 lines of text in a column. The page dimensions are 234 millimeters tall, 9.2 inches tall, and 173 millimeters wide, that's 6.8 inches wide. The margins at the top are 14 to 16 millimeters. The inner margin from this line to the edge can uh, is about 15 millimeters. It includes the references that you see. The outer margin from the edge of the notes to the edge of the paper is uh, 13 to 11 to 13 millimeters. And from the edge of the text to the edge of the page is 48 to 49 millimeters. At the bottom of the page, it is 54 to 56 millimeters on pages that do not have notes that spill over into the bottom of the page. On pages that do have notes that spill over, like back here in Paul's letters, this margin is only about 10 millimeters. The print I would characterize as dark and sharp but not particularly bold, and there is some print non-uniformity. This is about as extreme as I've found the print non-uniformity to be. A relatively dark page here on the left, and a light page here on the right. This is page 65 and page 107 in the New Testament. This um, print non-uniformity, I would say, is fairly common, but it's mild. Clearly, this is dark enough to read comfortably, but this uh, I think to my eyes is a little better. The font here in the text is about eight points and um, the line height is 2.85 millimeters. That's about 8.1 points. It's relatively comfortable. I don't think that the lines are too tightly packed. In general, the text is not line matched. As you should be able to see here, the print on the opposite side of the page does not line up with the print on this side. In the New Revised Standard Version, words that the translators add for clarity that don't map to words in the original languages are not in any special type of font, say an italic font. Pronouns for deity are not capitalized, as you can see in this passage. And the words of Christ in this particular edition are printed in black ink. They are not in red. There are the standard New Revised Standard Version text and translation notes. They're presented at the bottom of the page. They are in about a 6.5 point font. The standard New Revised Standard Version references are given in the inner margin. They are also in about a 6.5 point font. There are typos here in uh, the references given at 2 Timothy 1.3, for instance. It references 1 Thessalonians 1.21, which doesn't exist. The reference at First, uh, Second Timothy 1 7 points you to Romans chapter 18 verse 15. Romans does not have 18 chapters. In general, books of the Bible do not start on a fresh page. The book titles appear at the top of the page toward the outside. The page contents, that is the chapter of the book that you're looking at, are not presented. Page numbers are at the center bottom of the page. There are headings in the text. 
as you see here. The headings are in an italic 8-point font. There are verse numbers within the paragraphs. They're fairly easy to find. And there are chapter numbers. They're bold and they span about two lines of text. This Bible has relatively thick paper. I measure the page, or the sheet thickness, rather, at 54.7 micrometers, which allows me to estimate the paper weight at 50.50 GSM. There's a very light sheen on the paper. It's very nearly matte. It is off-white or cream, light cream in color. There is show-through. It is not at all distracting. It is possible to see where it's printed on the following page, but uh, it is so thick and opaque that it really is not an issue. There are explanatory notes in the outside margin, as you see here. Those are about 6.5 points in height, and as we saw earlier, they, there are sometimes so many of them that they spill over into the bottom of the page. So that's our general format of references in the inner column, inner margin, two columns of text, and then we have notes in the outer margin, and sometimes at the bottom of the page. Most pages we have a very wide margin at the bottom of the page, which is suitable for, for taking notes. At the end of the apocalypse, we find a glossary. The glossary is 70 pages long, and it's printed in an 8-point plus font. It's a bit larger than 8 points. So we have a lot of items, entries, that are defined here. The glossary is followed by chronological tables. Those are four pages long. Then we come upon weights, measures, and values on the right-hand side of the image there on your screen, followed by synopsis of the Gospels, that's nine pages. After the end of the synopsis of the Gospels, we enter into the maps section, which is on somewhat heavier paper. There are eight of these maps. They are not on glossy paper. This is non-glossy paper. They do not enter into the gutter. So these are good for writing on if you have the habit of doing that. And then we have the index to the maps itself, which is four pages in length, and it's a typical hardback, paste down construction. I've uh, removed the dust jacket so you can see the cover itself. It feels like cloth overboard. It's a sewn binding. We have red and yellow head and tail bands, which I think you can see there. The book does lie open in Genesis. We have some introductory material we'll take a look at here in a moment before Genesis. So that gives us a gravity assist. But it's relatively flat here. If we go in a few pages, we begin to see a curl into the gutter. So you may need to adjust the paper to be able to read it flat. Uh, from a flat surface as you go deeper in because you do have this drop off into the gutter. The inner margin isn't quite wide enough to keep the keep the text away from that dip. As we come into the Bible from the front, we see a half leaf, a full title page, explains that notes and references are by Howard Clark Key. Copyright page printed uh, in the United Kingdom at the University Press Cambridge. Gives the ISBN down here. Let me pull that closer so you can see that. And that's a 1989 copyright on the New Revised Standard Version. And the introduction notes, tables and glossary are copyright 1993. The contents. Uh, we have seen the material down here at the back of the Bible already. 
This is the preface to the New Revised Standard Version, commonly printed in the old New Revised Standard Version. I do intend to review the updated edition at some point when the paper copies are available. So we see the Old Testament books. This again is a 66 book Bible. It's interesting that he gives you the Greek names for some of the books, like 1st and 2nd Samuel are known in the Septuagint as 1st and 2nd Kingdoms, 1st and 2nd Kings as 3rd and 4th Kingdoms, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles are Paralipomenon, Ezra and Nehemiah are 2nd Esdras. So that's somewhat useful mapping there. And then we have the New Testament books, the normal 27 abbreviations for them used here. Other abbreviations. A list of the apocryphal books and their abbreviations, which are not included. And then we have other material. An essay on the story of the Bible. growth and structure of the New Testament, a bit about the canon, all in the same essay, preservation of the text, translations, starting with ancient translations. This is a rather, it is rather a lengthy ex essay, it's printed in a large font. A bit on the church in the apostolic age. And then introductions to the individual books of the Old Testament. I would characterize this as uh, academic, as skeptical, as naturalistic. So we see introductions to books of the Old Testament. And this goes on for a number of pages. The introduction to Daniel, we're almost to the end. And then there's the introductions to New Testament books. And after those are complete, we come to the Old Testament. The Old Testament is numbered in terms of page numbering. It's enumerated separately. It starts here at page 1, and then we return to 1, page 1 in the New Testament. And again, we have this format, 8-point font, 2 columns, paragraph format, references in the inner margin, which pushes the text farther away from the gutter, which is a good thing, and then the annotations in the outer column, and sometimes in the bottom of the page, in about a 6.5-point font. With my aging eyes, I can read this through my magnifying lenses. This is a close-up look at the font. I think, as I mentioned earlier, that the line spacing is adequate. It is a nicely printed font. Sharp, not especially bold. I would prefer it a bit bolder, but it is an attractive, rather standard-looking font. So now on the left, I've brought in the HarperCollins Study Bible, which is a much larger font. But the font on the right, because the paper has more a better opacity and there's less show through actually even though it's a lot smaller strikes me as being uh, more attractive and now on the left you see the font in the new revised standard version new oxford annotated bible with the apocrypha fifth edition and it does also um, a font printed on paper that has less opacity so there's more show through more background clutter Next, I would like to walk you through my normal translation charts. This is the continuum chart, which shows the more literal translations to the left, the less literal to the right. And remember that literalness and accuracy are not the same thing. Literalness has to do with the word-for-word -word nature of the translation. Do words in the original language map to words? Or expressions that uh, explain those words directly in the in the target language. The New Revised Standard Version is very near the center of the chart, just a little bit less literal than the CSB and a bit more than the NET and NAB. The next chart shows deviations from the Masoretic text towards an ancient translation or towards the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
and among English translations, the New Revised Standard Version does that frequently, just a bit more frequently than the New English Bible, and a bit less frequently than the, than the New American Bible Revised Edition. Following that, I have four charts where I graph on a scatter plot the source of the New Testament text that the translators used. So this first chart shows the Robinson Pierpont Byzantine text on the, ver on the horizontal or x-axis and the Nestle Elan 28th edition on the y. And you see uh, not a great deal of agreement with Robinson Pierpont and a relatively high level agreement with the Nestle Elan 28th edition. This next chart is a mirror image of the one that had Robinson Pierpont on the x-axis. It now has West Cotton Hort there. And as you can see, the New Revised Standard Version is with the other modern translations that have a relatively high level of agreement with West Cotton Hort. And again, a relatively high level agreement with Nestle Lawn 28th edition. On this chart, we see Robinson Pierpont on the x-axis again, and the New Revised Standard Version has a relatively low level agreement with the Byzantine text amongst the translations that um, are grouped in the upper left. It has a relatively low level of agreement with the West Cotton Hort text from the 19th century. And finally, you see on this chart the Tyndall House Greek New Testament from just a few years ago plotted on the x-axis. So those are percentages of agreement amongst these 153 verses where um, the New Revised Standard Version agreed with Tyndall House 55.6% of the time. Nestle Elan 28th edition is still there on the y-axis, and the Nestle Elan agreement is in excess of 80%. If you're interested in my method, there is a video uh, at this channel that you can find entitled A Four-Dimensional Perspective on Bible Translations, where I've attempted to explain my my methods, how I went about coming up with these scatter plots. I'll show you a few passages in the New Revised Standard Version in case you're not familiar with it. It is a gender-neutral translation, but I think it's the most elegant of them. So if that approach doesn't bother you or you prefer it, you may want to investigate it. It is being updated in the near future, but I'm sure these older 1989 New Revised Standard Versions will be available for quite a while. Here's a section from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. All we like sheep have gone astray. Here is a section from Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. That's known as the Magnificat. continues on the next page. This famous passage at the beginning of John's Gospel. And this very famous passage from chapter 3 of John's Gospel. And finally this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll pan down. So to give you a sense for the editorial approach of the study Bible, we'll take a look at a few of the book introductions and the notes. And we'll start here with the introduction to Genesis, where the author says the fact that God, as well as human leading characters in Genesis, are reported with different names is an indication of multiple sources which have been woven together to form Genesis as we have it. I'll let you read, pause, and read the remainder of that paragraph as you please. This is the book introduction to Isaiah. The editor mentions that the basic early core consists of prophetic oracles spoken by Isaiah in Jerusalem over a period of about 40 years. And then this core has been supplemented and edited by later generations. For the book of Daniel, 
the editor says, although the author writes as though he were living in the days of the Babylonian Empire, the historic, historical persons he describes in his symbolic way, and linguistic details as the use of Greek names, um, indicate that the book took its final form only in the 2nd century BCE. I'll let you read the rest of that. The introduction to Matthew, since the early centuries of the church, our first gospel has been attributed to Matthew, but he says that evidence uh, that it was written after the fall of Jerusalem suggests that it was not the work of one of Jesus' disciples, but was written by an unknown author late in the first century. The introduction to Luke indicates that Luke had three major sources, Mark, a source also shared with Matthew, known as Q, and a special source, otherwise unknown. The introduction to John says that there's no indication as to who wrote it, given in the Gospel itself, but by the second century, by the end thereof, it was attributed to John, the son of Zebedee, the disciple whom Jesus loved. There's no evidence that this assumption is accurate, and John 21 is almost certainly a later edition. The introduction to Hebrews, which you see on the right page, ends with this statement, since the references to the Israelite sanctuary and priesthood are based on Jewish scriptures, one need not assume that the Jerusalem temple was still standing at the time this letter was written. The intellectual level of the writing and the theoretical way in which the contrast with Jesus' sacrifices developed suggests that the anonymous author was writing in the late 1st or early 2nd century. The introduction to Second Peter points out that there are two important factors that show that Peter did not write the letter, its dependence upon Jude, and the fact that the writer uses many philosophical abstractions. The introduction to the book of Jude indicates that although Jude is claimed to be the author, that the style and content of the letter and the conditions within Christianity that are depicted come from a much later stage in the life of the church. The last paragraph in the introduction to the book of Revelation indicates that there's no way to determine which, which John wrote the work and um, can't be attributed to the author of the gospel and the three letters because the style is so different. Probably Revelation was written at the beginning of persecution of Christians by the Roman state, perhaps as early as the time of Domitian, or more likely during the reign of Trajan, who formulated the policy requiring universal participation in the emperor cult. And now let's take a look at a few notes, beginning with the note at Genesis 2.4 which identifies it as the earlier tradition about creation. Chapter 1's account was the priestly account, which is, is later. As in the priestly tradition, the earth exists, but is now shaped and ordered by Yahweh. Humans are created as males first, and then plants and animals, and finally a woman. In the note on Genesis 6, 1 through 8, he notes that the sons of God uh, refers to heavenly beings, and that the Nephilim were their offspring. Then here in the note in 6, 9 through 18 on the flood, it says that it is, uh, it parallels the ancient Akkadian epic of Gilgamesh. It's composite, incorporating features of the Yahwistic and priestly traditions. This is the note on Psalm 2, and I will just leave it up for a moment and let you read it. And here is the note on Isaiah 7, 14. It actually spans 13 through 20. But I'll leave this here for a moment so that you can read it. As best I can tell, this note on Isaiah 49, 1 through 7 identifies the servant of the Lord with the faithful remnant of uh, God's people. And I do not see any subsequent note that would lead you to believe that it actually changes to a reference to the Messiah. The note at Zechariah 13.6 
identifies the wounds as the masochistic acts of ecstatic prophets. The note at Matthew 123 identifies the quotation as from Isaiah 714, and uh, it says this is from the Greek translation, but the Hebrew original Alma means young woman. Here's the note on John chapter 20, 24 through 29, the encounter with Thomas, doubting Thomas. It says, uh, interestingly enough, that Thomas is shown the pierced hands inside of Jesus and acclaims him as Lord and God. And here in the note on Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, it reads, The image of the invisible God, this lofty poetic terminology, expresses the idea that in Christ the nature and being of God have been perfectly revealed. And finally, let's take a look at the notes on Revelation 22 and 25, where we're talking about a thousand years. It says it's to be taken symbolically. They are not to expect the final victory. I think he means over instead of off. Satan, death, and Hades to come immediately, even with their own lifetimes. The thousand years are God's own time, not like ours. It is a time for the martyrs and free from Satan's workings. And then if you go down to the note on verse 5, it says, The rest of the dead, the consequences of death continue during these thousand years. And the first resurrection is the reign of the martyrs. I don't think I showed you the back of the jacket, so in the summary I will do that. This is how it reads. It tells you its features. And it shows you the ISBN, which should have been on one of the introductory charts. Well, to summarize, um, it's a large study Bible, very thick paper with a sewn binding. The notes and introductions are somewhat skeptical in nature. The print is nice and sharp and relatively even, and if you have younger eyes or your lenses magnify sufficiently the eight-point font and the six-and-a-half-point font in the notes shouldn't be an issue for you. It is thick and relatively opaque paper, so show-through is not a great issue, and there's very little to no sheen on the paper, no glossiness. Those are good things. It does have a tendency to dip into the gutter through the center portions of the Bible, but you can adjust the pages that way so that, it, so that the page is relatively flat. A sewn binding. These are no longer in print, to my knowledge, but they are available. I did a Google search on the Cambridge Annotated Study Bible and one on the ISBN and several locations on the internet where used books are stored, came back with returns at reasonable prices. So you might want to check those out if you're interested at all in this Bible. And so with that, we'll finish. Thanks very much for watching, for your time. And as always, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel and to like the video.